Well, good evening, or late afternoon, I should say, here at Truth Baptist Church. If you're joining by way of live stream, it's good to have you here. It's a little unusual for us to do this this way, but we're glad that you're with us. If you are joining live or perhaps watching this later, thank you, Nicole, for playing. This reminds me of the COVID days and the blizzard and ice days. And uh, we went through two different periods of this where during COVID, we would come and have evening services or different services where I was just preaching to the camera. And then uh, last winter, we had three Sundays in a row, three uh, Sundays, one snowstorm, I think two ice storms, uh, where we were not able to have morning services and uh, just different. And But this kind of reminds me of that. Today is October 31st, and I uh, hope you're enjoying your time. You might be with family now. You might have plans later, uh, and that's why we're doing the things this way, uh, in order to give people that time to be with their family and to be able to impact their community and give the gospel in their neighborhood as kids come around and receive candy and whatever it is you've got planned. Uh, we thought we would just have a time now at four o'clock, and uh, I still feel like I'm not quite awake yet. <laughs> Usually our evening service is at six, and here we are at four, and I'm still trying to digest lunch, I think. And so anyway, uh, but we'll be fine. And I'm excited about the message that I have this evening. It's from 2 Samuel chapter 1. And we're continuing in our series through the life of David. So if you have your Bible, I hope you'll follow along with me. 2 Samuel chapter number 1. And last week we learned about the death of Saul. And how finally uh, everything came to an end for Saul he did not end well. He did not end with a good death. And really, it's a, a blot on Israel's history, and it's a blot on Saul's testimony, the way he lived and the way he died. Uh, we can learn a lot from that. We can learn about what not to do and how we should not go about living our lives. And unfortunately, Saul ended in shame. He died in shame. He actually died taking his own life, and after he witnessed three of his sons die in battle, he decided to fall upon his sword, and his armor bearer did the same thing. Now, we read this evening in 2 Samuel chapter 1 about David's reaction and how he responded after he learned of the news of King Saul dying in battle. And his reaction is very interesting and one that we can learn much from. Uh, he says a phrase time and again, I think three separate times in this passage. He says, how the mighty are fallen. And I want to read most of the chapter, but we're in 2 Samuel chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. There the Bible says, Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag, it came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered that the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon the Mount Geboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. He said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them hither unto my Lord." Then David took hold on his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. And David said unto the young man that told him, 
Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. And David lamented with his lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan. Also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. The beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty fallen? I want to pray for a few moments and then we'll consider several thoughts from this passage. Let's pray together. Lord, I ask that it just really this devotional time that you would speak to our hearts in just a real way, help us to learn a few thoughts from this passage and from this scripture that will help us. And I ask that we would consider our response in different situations, especially when we learn of bad news that someone has come upon or another believer who has, Lord, done something unfortunate and has reaped the consequences of that. I pray that we would always have the right response and not the wrong response. Help us in, uh, in how we conduct ourselves. And may we have a Christ-like attitude and a Christ-like reaction to all that we learn of day to day. Help us, Lord, even today. I pray that we would keep you our central thought and focus in everything. And no matter what's happening or going on, I pray that we wouldn't be distracted, but that we would keep our eyes on you. Help us now in these few moments together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is an interesting passage of scripture. Uh, as we've learned, Saul has died, and he fell upon his own sword in battle. And the one to bring the news to David is none other than an Amalekite. Uh, he came upon Saul. Obviously, he saw what had happened. And the Bible says that this man came out of the camp of Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head, and so he came to David, and the Bible says he fell to the earth, and he bowed down before David and uh, did obeisance. He gave honor to David, and David says, where do you come from? And he says, I came out of the camp of Israel, and, and I escaped, but the battle did not go our way. And David begins to ask him, you know, what took place, and he informs him that uh, Saul and his son Jonathan have been slain. And David's immediate reaction is one of great mourning and one of great sorrow. It's interesting what happens after the time of mourning there with David and his men. David inquires a little further about why this man came and informed them and what had taken place. And he said, well, he said, uh, Jonathan died because uh, I took his life. Or Saul died because I took his life. And he says, I had the opportunity because Saul was wounded and he knew he was about to die. And so he asked me to take his life and so I did. And he brought the bracelet that he had and he brought the crown that was on his head and he, he gave it to David. And David, you know, obviously is upset by this. He, he and his men mourn over it. And you would think that perhaps this this man would be doing this because he's trying to gain favor, and that's most likely what happened, because these stories don't add up. The story that we learned last week was that Saul uh, had fell upon his sword and he had taken his own life. This week, a much different story is given. This Amalekite man says that he took Saul's life himself, and so which was it? And it's not uncommon to have the same account in Scripture not be given the exact same way in different places in Scripture. We understand that. Uh, and so perhaps it was a situation where Saul fell upon his sword, but he still was not all the way dead, and so he asked the Amalekite to finish the job. However, that doesn't appear to be the case. What seems to have happened here is that this Amalekite went to Saul and Jonathan where they had died, and he took some of these items off of Saul, and he decided that he was going to try to capitalize on the situation and bring the report of the death of Saul to David and his men, and to frame it up in such a way to where he looked like he did the right thing. 
uh, to try to gain favor with the new king or soon to be king of Israel. And so he tells this story, he concocts a story about how he took his life. Well, that didn't go so well. And we read how it did not go so well because after David's done mourning and after he hears the story and thinks about it a little further, he asks him a more probing question. He says, why were you not afraid to stretch your hand against the Lord's anointed? What made you think that it was okay to take the life of the king of Israel? And why were you okay with that? And why are you coming and telling me this report as though everything's just fine that you did this? Remember, when David had several opportunities to take Saul's life, he refused to do so because he would not lift his hand against the king's against the, the king of Israel, against the Lord's anointed. And so obviously he ha has good reason to question this man as to why he would do such a thing, and he soon realizes that this man was lying and trying to take advantage of the situation. And as soon as he senses that, we don't even have time to learn of what the Amalekite's reaction was. David calls one of his young men, and he says, go fall upon him and take his life. And that's exactly what happens. So this is Amalekite, he doesn't live on in Scripture for very long. We see him give a false report, and he's eliminated. And Saul, uh, not Saul, but this man, he loses his life because of the lie that he told and because of his uh, glowing report about taking the life of the king of Israel. And he met his end that was appropriate to meet for saying such a thing and for concocting such a story. Uh, we go on and learn some more about this, but I want to give several thoughts here. The first one is this, don't rejoice in the downfall of others. There's different reactions that are had here. The Amalekite has a reaction that communicates that he was happy about the death of Saul. He even wanted to try to connect himself to it and maybe gain some kind of accolade or fame or good report or whatever it was for doing what he said he did, although he didn't do it. Uh, there seems to be a, an opportunistic spirit here to try to take advantage of a situation. Uh, this Amalekite didn't care about Saul. All he cared about was himself. Uh, what do we do and how do we react when we hear about the downfall of others? David's reaction was much different. The Bible says in verse 11 that he takes hold of his clothes and he rents them and all the men that were with him, they, they rent their clothes, they go into sorrow and into mourning. And that's the right reaction to have. Now remember, and we've studied this and considered this, King Saul wanted to kill David. But regardless, David understood the, the magnitude of the situation. And he realized that this was not a time for rejoicing. This was not a time for jumping for joy. This was not a time to, to find relief and cry tears of joy. This was a time for mourning. This was the father of his closest friend in life, Jonathan. Uh, this was a man who he played the harp for. This was a man who he, uh, at one time, served under. And now, he's no longer here. He's no longer with the people of Israel. And there's sadness there. And David recognizes that. There's no rejoicing in how Saul ended, because he ended so poorly. And we should never rejoice in the downfall of someone else. Uh, I know human nature sometimes is to be happy that we're not going through the difficulty that perhaps other people are going through. But yet that's not the spirit the Lord has called us to. God's word tells us that we are to rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with those that weep. Well, that's exactly what was happening here. David, he's weeping, weeping over the loss of Saul and over the loss of his friend Jonathan, and they even fast until the evening time uh, for Saul and his son. Why? Because these were men who led Israel for a number of years. And these were men whose God, who God's hand was on, and they took the time to, to give that attention. Which brings me to my th second thought, and that's this. Mourn the death of God's servants. The Bible says in verse 17, And David lamented with his lamentation over Saul, 
and over Jonathan, his son. There was lamentation that was made. There was a mourning that took place in David's heart. There was weeping. There was sadness. And it's good and it's right to take the time to mourn the death of God's people. I think sometimes we become so flippant about everything. We live in a day and time in which people die and we don't give much attention to it at all. We've come out of a season of COVID where family members have not even been able to be in person with their loved ones as they've breathed their last breath. And I think in all of this, there's kind of become just a, an anonymity. There's kind of become a, a separation, maybe even more opportunity for people to separate themselves from death separate themselves from the difficulty of it and while none of us should be morbid in how we live we should take time and take moments to pause and reflect upon lives that have especially known the Lord and lived for God uh, I still appreciate old-fashioned funeral services uh, where you take time to gather together with friends and family and and there is time given for uh, a remembrance about that person, and then a message is given. I especially enjoy funeral services and that if I'm the one who officiates it, I get to give the gospel. I, I think there's no time like times like that where someone can receive the gospel. Uh, and in funeral services and remembrances of someone's life to give the truth because we're all thinking about our own mortality and we're thinking about our own life and how short it is. Well, David, he regarded life, and he wasn't flippant about it. He didn't have a wrong reaction to it. And we should follow suit. May God help us to really take some time and think about those who've gone on before us. And when their moment of death comes, uh, we should make that an ordeal. And we should pause and have a service and uh, have scripture that is given. One of the blessings that I have here in Mechanicsville is that at least with one funeral home locally and on a couple of occasions with another, I've had the opportunity to fill in and to officiate funeral services for people who don't have a pastor. And I've gone all over our town and I've given my card and I've said, if you ever have a family or someone who needs a pastor, just please tell them to give me a call and I'd be more than happy to do it. And I've done a number of services that way. I will always do them if I'm available, and I'll try to do everything I can to be available, because life is to be regarded, and there's always sadness when death ensues. It, we, we should never be happy over death. We should never rejoice over it. It's never something that we should just grow cold or indifferent to or just become so used to that it doesn't mean anything anymore. No, death is an ordeal. Death is a big deal because sin brings it about. And life is something that God has preciously granted. And so because we value life, we should observe death and the end of life and give consideration to it because life comes from God and death is a result of sin. And that's where the gospel begins. And we understand for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord for that. And I'm thankful that David showed a spirit of consideration and regard, even for this man who was his arch enemy in so many ways. He mourned over the death of one of God's own. And then I want to say this, finally, as my final thought in this devotion, and that is, remember the good. There, there might be a lot of bad memories we have in connection with a certain person or a group of people, but don't ever forget to remember the good where we can do so. David actually writes this lamentation. It's almost like a psalm. It's a poem. And the sweet warrior poet of Israel, he goes to the pen yet again, and he brings forth a song of remembrance for the slain. 
And the Bible says, again, verse 19, the beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ascalon. Yet lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gaboa, let there be no dew, neither let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, for there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away. The shield of Saul as though he had not been anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not em empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives. Now, let me stop there for a moment. That certainly wasn't always the case with Saul. But in David's final remembrance, that's what he chooses to acknowledge. The Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives. And in their death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothe you in scarlet with other delights, who put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of battle? O oh, Jonathan, thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How are the mighty fallen, and the weapons of war perished? How are the mighty fallen? That's how David responded. What a beautiful tribute he gives here. And it's beautiful because he remembers the good. He is referring to Saul here in terms like mighty, pleasant, strong, he refers to Saul and his son in such good terms. And I understand we shouldn't paint a false picture of someone at their end. Uh, however, I believe everything that David was writing here was true. There were some great qualities that Saul had and that Jonathan had. They were lovely. They were present. They were strong. Uh, they were mighty. And David chooses that as his memory. I'll tell you, we should do the same. We should choose to remember the good. When we've been wronged by somebody, as hard as it is, choose to remember the good. David had been wronged terribly by Saul. And yet in Saul's death, he puts all that aside and he remembers the good. If you've been wronged by somebody when you were younger, try to choose to remember the good. If you've been wronged by a friend who you thought was a friend and turned out to be an enemy, who stabbed you in the back, who made you think that they were close to you and that they regarded you and loved you, who really cared less for you, still choose to remember the good. Maybe there's been a breach in a relationship. Maybe there's been a divorce. Maybe there's been a death. And I'll tell you, you could spend the rest of your life remembering the bad and growing mighty angry and bitter about it all. But you know and I know that's not what God has called us to. The Lord has called us to remember the good and choose to remember those things. The Bible says over in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, listen closely to these verses. If you'd like to turn there, you can. But the Bible says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Follow peace with all men. That's what David did. And I have to ask all of us, is that what we're doing? Are we seeking to follow after peace? Do you want to be at peace with people? Or do you want to be in contention? Some people thrive off of conflict. They prefer it. They enjoy it. 
They like contention and conflict. They want to be at odds with people. Uh, others don't like it so much, but they also uh, just cho choose to avoid people altogether. And they'd rather just ignore someone or cut them out of their life or cancel them out of their life rather than give them attention and try to work through things. Oh, they don't want to have a face-to-face -face conflict, but they live in conflict internally the rest of their life because they don't deal with issues and they don't ever forgive anybody and they choose to cancel them out. Well, the Bible says they do the exact opposite. Follow peace and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. I don't want to fail of God's grace. And then I certainly don't want to be guilty of what the rest of the verse says lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. I don't want just that little root of bitterness to get in and take hold and begin to grow and to begin to fester. One of the best things I can do to keep that from happening is to choose to remember the good and to not reflect and stew on and dwell on the negative and on the bad. No, that's not what God would want us to do. Remember the good. If King David who was hunted like a dog for about 12 years or so, or a decade at least, by King Saul, chose at the end of Saul's life to remember the good about him, a man who wanted to kill him and tried to time and, to and time and time again. If David can remember the good, so can we. About whoever it is that we might have a, a bad thought about or unpleasant memories of, or who we're remaining angry or bitter at. We need to ask that God would help us. We need to ask that the Lord would help us to have the right spirit. Never rejoice over the downfall of somebody else, even if the downfall is that of your own enemy. Occasionally, and I've shared this with you, you'll hear of a preacher who falls. He falls into sin, or he falls into something else, and he, he messes up his testimony, and therefore he, he can no longer go on being a pastor. Every time I hear a story like that, my first reaction is sorrow. Because I hate to hear of men of God who've been serving God to fall in dramatic fashion. But the next thought is for me to humbly say, Lord, please keep your hand of protection upon me because I recognize that I'm just a man myself, and I'm capable of falling as well. And Lord, I don't want to meet that same fate. I don't want to end in the same way. That should be the prayer of every one of us. Remember when Noah became a husbandman after the flood, and he got drunk off of the grapes that he grew, and uh, the Bible says that he fell asleep naked in his tent, and Two of his sons went in and they saw his nakedness and Ham decided to laugh at that. He thought it was a big joke. But then Japheth went and he covered his father's nakedness. But we should never be like Ham, the one who laughs at sin or makes a mock at sin or rejoices and thinks it's great when something sinful has taken place to enter into laughter and mockery over a very unfortunate situation, or even to have some kind of inner glee or inner contentment. Maybe it's not something that manifests itself outwardly, but inwardly maybe there's some kind of satisfaction, some kind of sick satisfaction that we get that someone fell. That should never be our heart. Like David, we should mourn and Mourn genuinely. Sometimes relationships are complicated. Remember, David understands that without Saul, there would be no Jonathan, and Jonathan honestly helped him to get through much of his young adult life. Well, if Saul wasn't around, there wouldn't be Jonathan because Jonathan was Saul's son. So his closest friend in life is the son of his arch enemy in life. 
that's a that's a real tricky situation. I've got to tell you, there are relationship complexities like that all over the place. Maybe you're close to the child, but the, the parents make things miserable. Or maybe you have a great relationship with the parents, but uh, their children make things difficult. And, or maybe it's some other kind of interworking relationship with family or with friends or with other Christian believers that, that cross one way or the other. And we have to think about these things, and we have to have wisdom. The Bible says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And we need to think clearly. David didn't want to hurt or hinder his relationship with Jonathan as a result of how he could react to Jonathan's father, Saul. And yes, Jonathan was wise. He understood that Saul was a majorly troubled man, but, but Jonathan was still his son. We have to think about these things. We have to have wisdom about these things. And it's not that we forsake truth or don't speak truth, but we also have to know from God how to conduct ourselves. And may God give us that wisdom, and he'll help us. Most importantly, choose to remember the good. Several times David says, how are the mighty falling? And if a great man or woman of God falls, that's what our, our response should be. How are the mighty falling? Not, oh, did you hear? Can you believe? This is unbelievable. Or, wow, how about that? Oh, no. We should always have the heart that says, oh, how are the mighty fallen? And may we fall to our knees and say, Lord, spare me. Help me. Keep your arm of care around me. Keep your loving protection upon me. Because I don't want to be one that falls myself. We should have the heart that says, Lord, I want to make it to the end. Well, let's do that. Let's try to take as many as we can with us. Let's help those on every side. And when someone does fall, let's remember what's been given this evening. And I believe if we do, God will help us. Let's remember, let's mourn those who have lost their lives. And uh, let's choose to remember the good with those individuals and, and not the bad. And uh, let's regard them and give attention and give honor to whom honor is due. And I believe the Lord will bless that. That's the message this afternoon. It's been good to spend a few moments with you, and I thank you for listening. Uh, I don't know what your plans are the rest of the day. I know at my house we're going to have some candy, a big old bowl of candy we'll give out to some children. Uh, we have some gospel tracts that we're going to give out. And uh, pray that we'll make those connections and that some young people would see the gospel message and maybe read it later. Uh, maybe their parents will be with them, and we can talk to them for a little bit. Uh, I know uh, when kids come out trick-or-treating, I typically see families I've never seen in our neighborhood the entire time I've lived there. Maybe it's the same for you. Uh, but let's take advantage of that opportunity. I pray that you'll have a wonderful rest of the evening. One of the things I want to say as well, and I mentioned it this morning, is we're going to be in the Mechanicsville Christmas Parade, our church, and there's plenty of opportunities to be involved there. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet on the info table, so I want to encourage everybody to sign up for that. If you've not already done so, sign up, and uh, let's get involved, and let's ask the Lord to help us to really make an impact and make a difference in our community. Uh, this is just one way of many ways that we'll do that. And then think of all the other things that we have forthcoming. We're going to meet together again Wednesday night for our midweek service and our Flyers Club and our Kings Kids and everything that's happening there. And then uh, tomorrow begins a new calendar month, the month of November. We're going to have our praise and pie service on Sunday evening, the 21st. That'll be the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And uh, Lord willing, in the next week or so, we're going to have those pictorial directories ready to give out. And uh, if you've not gotten your picture taken, but you would like to, and you're a new member of the church, or you've recently joined, or would like to be a part of of the directory. <clears throat> you don't have to be a member. It's friend, members and friends. But maybe you'd like your information there or your picture so you can uh, be able to be contacted. Let us know that and we'll try to get everything ready to go here very soon.
Hope you have a wonderful night. It's been a blessing to be with you. God bless you, and have a great evening.